Welcome back. We're live at Supex, the Startup Expo, with Andrew Goldner, co-founder at GrowthX. Andrew, welcome to the show. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Grateful. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on the show. Thank I think you. what you guys are doing at GrowthX is actually really fascinating. But maybe before we get into that, let's get to know you a little bit better. Sure. And give us a little background on yourself, kind of where you grew up, where you went to school. Yeah. I so I, I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. Okay. Interesting. Um, went to undergrad at University of Cincinnati and graduate school at Georgetown. What did you take? Um, I was a finance major undergrad okay. um, in law school at Georgetown, so okay. got my graduate degree there. Okay. Went to New York City after that to practice law at a large firm. That's when I got started in the technology space. So I was a technology lawyer okay. when the internet was first commercializing. Interesting. So some of the earliest pioneers across many of the areas, um, uh, Priceline, sure. Alta Vista, yeah, yeah. Um, working with the uh, International Corporation of Assigned Names and Numbers to create the dot com system and the rules around that. Uh, oh, interesting. Double click, uh, went inside a double click for Google. Um, so that's really where I got my start in the technology career. From there, I went around the world to Hong Kong and Singapore for about seven years before wow. coming back to America. Okay. Um, returning to the early stage where I really enjoyed, went to Silicon Valley, started a couple of companies uh, as a founder okay. what I what I refer to as expensive learning opportunities <laughs> fair enough <laughs> um, and it was all along that journey that I met my now co-founders and we started GrowthX about five and a half years ago interesting so what exactly is GrowthX and why did you guys decide to start it up well nowadays you know broadly it's a Silicon Valley based partnership that works okay. with companies helping them harness disruption okay to grow profitable businesses okay we started out as a venture capital fund okay um, where we were helping companies not only to fund product market fit, but also to find product market fit. Our expertise is helping startups and other innovators understand the framework for developing a market okay. with the same rigor and process and intentionality as most founders put towards developing their product. Interesting. And so we built, a f at first, a fund that was structured in a way that allowed us to focus and help where we thought help was needed the most, okay. which was not just writing the checks, right? Uh, which we did. We were on the cap table and we're investors and that's important, seed stage venture capital. We have 43 companies across wow. two funds. But where we differentiate ourselves is our founders are working with us, not primarily because of the money, yeah. but because of our expertise in helping them develop their market. Okay. And then should they choose to go on and raise additional venture capital. So why did you kind of transition, not away from the venture capital side, but like, how did, why did you decide to evolve it? It's a great question. Frankly, it was just demands of the market. Okay. Um, you know, when we launched, we, when we launched GrowthX, we had a private accelerator inside of the fund. What we call our market acceleration program started okay. as a reverse paywall. We couldn't help you until we gave you money. So it was a private accelerator that was uh, okay. only available to companies that we invested in. Okay. And we had scaling problems because not enough people understood our expertise. Everybody was focused on features and functions and not enough people uh, were focused on the people and their problems and how to solve them and the framework for doing that. Interesting. And so we actually launched GrowthX Academy, okay. um, our boot camp, to do that. So we got into the private school business because we said, why are the general assemblies of this world blanketing the globe with developer yeah. boot camps, but not even a single market developer boot camp has been created. So we live in the age of applied technology. Technology become cheaper and easier. And because of computer science degrees and boot camps, more people know how to do it. Sure. But just as few people know how to do the market development side. So we got into GrowthX Academy to first solve our own problem. I mean, we smart. We like to say at GrowthX, each of the founders suffers from entrepreneurism, <laughs> otherwise known That's as shiny awesome. object syndrome. Um, we see a problem, we can't help trying to solve it. <laughs> sure. And so instead of just blogging about it or complaining about it, we launched a school. Okay. Well, GrowthX Academy is flipped classroom, project-based learning. And so while the students were in that first program in San Francisco, eight of the 12 weeks, they were working on projects. Okay. And it worked great because companies got free growth help, students got experience in a job. So, so like they were placed with a company or how did that work? They would get on, work on projects, either that we would find oh, or they okay. would source. Okay. And okay. typically it was a startup, a startup that wanted access to our expert instructors and the force multiplier of the student because that gave them free growth help. Right. The students got experience and oftentimes a job. And as fund manager, I got the only form of legal insider trading in America. 
Because when you put a student into a company and you train them how to do market development and they share everything they learn, that's a lot more valuable and interesting than a pitch deck. Sure. And I earned the opportunity to invest because I had built a relationship with that startup by deploying a student and using my instructors to help them. Interesting. And then the company that they're working with could potentially buy them too, right? If well, they change the... Well, so that's part of it too, yeah, right? And so what really happened smart. was some of the students inside of... I mean, that that's definitely going to be more interesting than I am, by the way. No, that's all good. Um, the uh, What happens is some of the students were not interested in working at a startup or didn't have the risk profile for a startup and they okay. wanted to know if they could do innovation projects to larger corporations. Sure. And so they started bringing in projects from larger corporations and that's where GrowthX Corporate came from, which is our corporate innovation practice. Interesting. Because those corporate innovation um, projects, they wanted more help than just the eight or 12 week student project. Right. And so we launched GrowthX Corporate to be able to do that in that scale. And now we work with some of the larger corporations around, around the world. And it was just in that process that we had an inbound from a country, the country of Malaysia, that was going through a digital transformation with its population and saw what we were doing and wondered if we could help. And that launched our civic innovation practice group. Very cool. So everything we've done, it's either been solving our own problem sure. or responding, responding to inbound interest and saying, hey, that was interesting and maybe we can scale that and everything is strategically related because right. everything that we do ultimately allows us to find, identify the best founders in the world sure. and earn the opportunity to invest in them by being helpful to them. Yeah, And, well, that's and part you of basically the get them a client, right? Their first Absolutely. client, which first is huge. First customer. Uh, first, uh, you know, uh, a strategic investor, a potential, as you say, acquirer. Yeah. yeah. And so the ecosystem worked really well. Uh, and so ultimately what we started doing is building ecosystems for states in America, sure. for Canada, for Malaysia, for Korea, starting to talk a lot now in Israel. And so it's basically taking this ecosystem that we had built as GrowthX and the pillars of GrowthX and, and licensing it and teaching it and training it. Smart. Interesting. So... How do you guys decide where to put your, your money, really? Well, for, for GrowthX Capital, yeah. I mean, you know, we're B2B, SaaS, marketplace okay. investors. They've got to be capitally efficient with $10 billion SAMs or more. Okay. But they also have to have founders who are learn-it-alls and not know-it-alls. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Right? Fair. And people who have an insatiable curiosity for learning, people that set aside their ego in favor of winning, people who reserve the right to be less wrong tomorrow than they are today. Sure. How do you they, figure that out, though? Because that's oh, got to be question. tricky. There is, there, is no, there is no silver bullet. Okay. But what we find is, and different funds do this differently, and, and there are funds that are later staged than us, that okay. have more assets under management and write larger checks. Okay. And so they're their due diligence process just is naturally longer. Okay. We form relationships by being helpful, right? Sure. And so we, so the, the various things that we do at GrowthX really are designed to give us an opportunity to get to know the founding team. People first is our, is our number one core value. Sure. Um, there, is no, there is no silver bullet to your question. There is no one way to answer that. But there also is no microwavable version. Right. And we know that we're not going to get there from what we call innovation theater, okay. which is a two-minute demo day pitch in a big theater with booming bass and flashing light bulbs. Yeah. That's just not where we play. Sure. And so getting to know a founder um, and being able to spend time helping and understanding um, sure. is, a, is a big well, part of how Especially in your we other verticals, that. right? Exactly. Like you, you basically, from day one... And then you can put money in at any stage, but you, and then you're also introducing them to customers. And, exactly. Yeah, it's interesting. That's you exactly can almost right. control the whole thing from like idea to well, exit. It's, it's sources of signal and asymmetric information. Smart. Interesting. Which most companies don't do we have, from zero to... We haven't seen it done, um, certainly not at our stage in the exact same way. Sure. Um, but there are certainly, I mean, the, 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 the closest analogy in the ones that we're doing it long before we were and are doing it at an enormous scale is Techstars. Okay. They have an enormous yeah, sure. amount of respect for what they're doing. And if you dig into why they're doing what they're doing, it, it aligns very closely with why we're doing what we're doing, the, the challenges that we spot with the, 
venture capital sure. profession and how it's practiced and who's a good money manager and how money is deployed and whether more money is deployed after initial investments and how do you decide who deserves your money and who doesn't. And just it really came from a place of understanding that venture might be practiced differently. Right. And how do we do that? Sure. Techstars started before we did. They started with a bigger brand than we started with and they're doing it at scale now. Right. Um, but I would say that that's the closest analogy that I've seen. Okay. Interesting. So how do you guys decide where to put your venture money? Well, I, you know, again, um, it's not, you know, dissimilar to a typical diligence of okay. a venture capital fund. Like I said, we, we only invest in B2B SaaS and marketplace. Yeah. You have to be seed stage, which nowadays is post revenue. We're focused on the people, not the product, not the but, technology, not the market first. It's all about, are these people learn it alls, okay. right? Are they running an experiment? Do they understand the process to go forward and find profit efficiently? But if you're post revenue, mm -hmm. how, do, then how do you fund the early stage kind of day zero companies? Well, we don't fund day zero companies. Okay, so you're, you'll find them the client and then eventually we're, put in money? That... We're seed stage companies. So okay. when somebody comes to pitch GrowthX Capital, which is yeah. our fund, yeah. they're, they're post revenue. Because okay. in the age of sure. applied technology, there's just simply no excuse for them not to be. They're not inventing a molecule. They're okay. not even doing anything sure. hardware. It's all capital efficient. And just nowadays with technology as cheap as and easy as it is, and so many people knowing how to deploy it, and, and developer platforms that make it more efficient to build it and deploy it and go through the MVP process in a really smart way. We have sure. a company in our portfolio called Boss Framework that's actually here at this conference okay. um, that does just that, okay. um, helping, helping startups get to market in a much more efficient way with their product. Okay. The point is, is that there's just no excuse nowadays if you think you're venture capable, which means you think you can be very big, very fast, for you to go raise series seed capital and not have revenue. There's okay. just no reason not no, to. There's something, the, the heuristics of what you're doing are flawed if you aren't able as a founder or a founding team to get post revenue before needing to raise a, a significant round of capital. Interesting. Okay. So what trends do you see in, in raising money or venture capital right now? Well, I mean, I like to say that A is now the fifth letter of the alphabet in venture capital. Okay. I mean, there are four rounds that you'll raise before you get to your A, and, and there's a reason that it was called A in the first place. It was the first. Sure. And so one of the trends that I see is that the traction milestones at every stage of the funding process are getting yep. higher, more elongated, more challenging. Sure. And so you're less less companies are able to get from point A to point B. It's what I call the trough of disillusionment. Sure. What others have called the series A crunch. And so what founders do absolutely need to understand is you, you are expected to have gotten farther for little or no outside capital right. when you're going to raise from a venture capitalist. Because again, in the age of applied technology, there's just no excuse for you not to. Um, I see definite trends with corporate venture capital. It's yep. becoming a very real profession. Uh, the number of new corporates that are investing typically off their balance sheet with their first dollars year over year is growing at over 50% annually. Interesting. Um, I think corporates generally are getting better at it. They, they understand that it isn't just a hobby and you can't just take someone from M&A and now all of a sudden they're going to invest off the balance sheet at the earlier stages. They're understanding they need to put their best foot forward and help a startup understand why strategically that startup should work with the company and what they get out of it. Okay, the corporations are less and less asking for non-market terms like rights of first refusal, which bring down the enterprise value and turn off financial VCs. Sure. And so there's more subject matter expertise from a strategic. There's also more first customer opportunity from a strategic. And so corporate venture is absolutely a phase as well, um, okay. a, a trend as well that I see. Um, and I think obviously the other thing too is more people are realizing that you don't have to live in Silicon Valley, yeah. right? Um, the idea of being a founder in Southern Florida, a relatively reasonable place to live with a high quality of life, with a lot of very intelligent people that have really good ideas and there are customers nearby. Sure. Why would you move away from that, your friends and your family, sure. and move to go to the most expensive rat race in America just to be close to your capitalists? 
And so sure. I think there's a growing trend and an interest to deploy capital outside the valley. And okay. then it gets back to your question, how do you build those relationships and make investment decisions when those people aren't in your neighborhood? Sure. Um, and that's, that's a challenge, but it's something that's also happening more and more. Yeah, well, and it also seems like you, as a venture company, you want to probably get out of the geographical region of Silicon Valley as well, right? To diversify and find other stuff? I definitely no? think, well, I think there's a lot of reasons to. Okay. Um, the competition is so drastic and so much of it is so unhealthy. Sure. The pricing. Yeah, the crazy valuations. The crazy valuations that are being driven for a limited partner or a venture capitalist's agenda and not a startup's agenda. Sure, because if you raise too much money that you can never pay back, well, yeah. it's, it's, it's not about, it's, it, I mean, it's, it's, what it really is more about is when venture capitalists are building bigger funds and needing to deploy more uh, capital okay. in a relatively short period of time, Got you. and they have a certain amount of the company that they want to own at the stage you're at for their portfolio theory, I see. the math just starts to mean they have to write bigger checks, and so therefore they have to insist on higher valuations so that they're not owning an outsized part of your cap right. table at the stage you're at. Okay. But it's also just because of supply and demand. Sure. Um, the reality is most startups in Silicon Valley don't need access to a jet propulsion laboratory or, sure. or to, you know, uh, you know, Cal Berkeley engineers or Stanford engineers. Um, again, it's not necessarily where the customer base is. Sure. Um, you know, we have a saying at GrowthX that the best people to raise money from are your customers. Yeah. They don't take board seats or equity, and they just want you to help them. Yeah. Well, and especially early on, a lot of times if you give them the ability to like suggest features or give you feedback, they'll feedback be customers forever, right? And again, early customers are not so much customers as partners. Yeah. Typically with software, you're going to market with something that's not whole and complete, and you're looking for partners who are willing to work with you, the so-called innovators and early adopters that'll take that journey with you and help sure. you as partners. Um, is very important. And yes, you definitely have that mentality overwhelmingly in Silicon Valley. But again, it's not necessarily that the customers are there. Sure. I mean, the other thing I would say to founders everywhere, right, including here in Southern Florida where we are, is Silicon Valley may own venture capital, but they don't own entrepreneurship. And sure. I think the narrative that's leaked out of the valley into so many places, including Southern Florida, is somehow that Silicon Valley has a stranglehold on entrepreneurship, which they do not, right? Interesting. To me and to anybody at GrowthX, an entrepreneur is anybody who wants to work in their own company. They just don't want to work in your company. Right, that's an entrepreneur. I don't want to work sure. in your company. I want to work in my own company. Yeah, smart. But that doesn't necessarily mean that I necessarily want to have, you know, eighteen locations in three countries in seven months. That sure. might be a venture capital entrepreneur. And so, what I what I would encourage founders around the world to be thinking about is deciding first with yourself and your co-founders and your family what type of company you want to build and how you want to run that company. Learn about the venture asset class, understand how it behaves and what it's going to expect of you, sure. and first make the decision that that's how you want to behave. Yeah, because it's but not for everybody, right? It's not for yeah, everybody. Which is interesting. And what I find is so many founders go after trying to convince the venture capitalists that they deserve it before first deciding whether they want it. Interesting. And it creates a violent relationship and an unhealthy atmosphere when you're, you're seeking growth milestones that are either beyond your means, beyond your interests, or just simply well not impossible. Sure. And so I think, that's, I think the health and wellness of the entrepreneurial ecosystem depends on that. Um, and I think a lot of what's happening in, in the larger ecosystems is unhealthy and not sustainable. No, I 100% agree with you. It, it's interesting to hear from somebody like yourself that's obviously done this a bunch of times, like talk about, openly talk about, you, you might not want it. Right, like, we talk about that all the time. I mean, I, I am very, um, very intentional when I refer to venture as an asset class. Sure, I'm doing that because I want to demystify it and okay. de-romanticize it. The sure. romance meter on venture, the romance meter on entrepreneur, are at an all-time high now because of yeah. mainstream media and yeah. Hollywood. Sure. And the reality is, is that it is an extraordinary, you're an entrepreneur, you know, you've been through it. It's an extraordinarily difficult yeah. thing to do that very few people can do. And it's in many ways, it is, um, 
you know, runs counter to normal yeah. human behavior. Totally. Well, it's, it's probably the best and worst thing I've ever done. Which at the same time, which that, is like there you go. And every hour you could it would probably change. Right. People talk about like, was it a good week? Good yeah. week. Yeah, you're like, I'm like minute to minute, brother. Yeah, yeah. Totally. Like I'm on the high, the high, and the low, the low. And of yeah. course, as humans, we typically don't give ourselves the credit for the high, but yeah. we'll beat ourselves up to death on the low. Totally. And entrepreneurism is all about these extremes. And so it's important that people understand that ride yeah. and be intentional about what they want to do and why they want to do it and how they want to, who they want to do it yeah. with. Totally. Um, but venture is an asset class and it has a set of non-obvious characteristics and you ought to know them. Like people pitch me and I'm like, well, do you know what venture capital is? Do you know the source of my capital? Do you know what I expect of you? If you yeah. don't know those answers, then how do you know you want my capital? Yeah, interesting. Like, do your homework, basically. Do, do your homework. Cool. Well, we're out of time, so let's close with mentioning okay. where people can get more information about you guys. Yeah, go to growthx.com. The one thing I will say it's okay. really important is we have open sourced our entire market development program wow. for any founder in the world to get for free what up until now has only been available for our portfolio companies. Very cool. And so it's called the hashtag GXMXP series, okay. MXP being Market Acceleration Program. And if you go to growthx.com in the drop down menu, you'll see GXMXP series. Sign up every single week for the next 35 weeks, starting two weeks ago. We are posting on an interactive blog platform the step-by-step -step methodical process that awesome. every founder needs to go through to see if their product will fit in the market and if they can do it profitably. Interesting. So that's, we're doing that because we want more founders to win. Sure. Well, that's awesome. Well, Andrew, thanks again for doing it. I really Thank appreciate you for your taking time. the time. It's All my right. pleasure to be here. Thank you. Cheers. Bye.